I'm good. Good afternoon. We're going to start a little bit early to make sure our speaker gets the greater balance of time. This afternoon, we continue one of the most important speaker series in the life of this university. The Critical Conversation speaker series includes scholars and thought leaders from throughout the nation who will inform, enrich, and challenge our thinking on matters of diversity and inclusion, on free speech, and on intellectual and viewpoint diversity. We seek to ignite further intellectual curiosity amongst our students and to inspire our faculty to engage in these ideas in the classroom and to encourage our leadership administrators and staff on our campus to reflect and engage with one another about these very important topics. This afternoon marks the second feature of critical conversations and focuses on an interesting concept in diversity and inclusion science called unconscious bias. New knowledge in brain science has given us insights into the manner in which our brains are wired and into the idea that everyone has biases. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anna Franco Watson, who is chair of our Department of Psychology and the College of Liberal Arts, who will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, and welcome to the second conversation of Auburn University Critical Conversation Speaker Series. We're very happy to have all of you here. As you know, and as Dr. Clayton uh, stated, this series offers our campus an opportunity to explore diverse perspectives and ideologies important to our campus culture. As part of the speaker series, members of our campus are invited to submit ideas and questions for critical conversations using the conversation cards that are in front of you. These cards will be collected and after each, speak, after each speaker to facilitate small group discussions, there's a acrylic box at the end over there that you can drop your uh, card off before you leave here today. Um, as Dr. Clayton said, I'm uh, Dr. Anna Franco Watkins. I'm a ch chair and professor in psychology. I'm also a decision scientist, so this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so I have the distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, lifelong social justice advocate Howard Ross. Howard is one of the world's seminal thought leaders on identifying and addressing unconscious bias. In addition to being the founding partner of Cook Ross, a firm dedicated to providing systems level interventions by driving inclusive leadership and culture for the world's most influential organizations. Apparently, in his spare times, 
He is able to be the author of several books, notably uh, Washington Post bestseller, Everyday Bias, Identifying and Navigating Unconscious Judgments in Our Daily Lives, in addition to several others, in his recent book, Our Search for Belonging, How the Need for Connection is Tearing Our Culture Apart, will be published next year in 2018. In addition, uh, his work has received significant distinguished awards, and I'll just highlight a couple. Operation Understanding Award for Community Service, the Winds of Change Award from Forum on the Workplace and Diversity and Inclusion, the Diversity Peer Award from Diversity Women Magazine, the Catalyst for Change Award from Wake Forest University, and as well as the 2016 Leadership and Diversity Award by the World Human Resources Development Conference in Mumbai, India. Howard holds an undergraduate degree from my own alma mater in history and education from the University of Maryland and has completed postgraduate work in leadership and management at Wheelock College. So without further ado, please welcome, help me and join me welcoming Howard Ross. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I want to start with a story. Uh, I was in Jackson, Mississippi about maybe two, three years ago now. I was doing some work down there at Jackson State University with the faculty and the, and the uh, deans. And uh, had to fly from there to New York City to be with another client. So I had to fly through Memphis. So I take, get the plane to Memphis, get there in time for the last flight out. I get to the gate. And as I get to the gate, I hear those words that travelers hate the most. There'll be a 45-minute delay. And as soon as the words came out of the gate attendant's mouth, this voice booms out from behind me. You talking to us, lady? And I turn around, and there's a guy sitting behind me who I would best describe as Santa Claus with an attitude. Um, you know, older white guy, white beard, white hair, wearing overalls, a flannel shirt with a car magazine in his hand. So I kind of chuckled to myself. I kind of had him pegged. Let me get up from under the speaker here. And uh, went about my business, you know, working on my computer until it was time to get on the plane. 45 minutes pass as we get on the plane, and I get to my seat, and lo and behold, who's sitting next to me but angry Santa? You know? So we did the nod. Some of you who travel know what I mean. You know, you kind of acknowledge each other and take off, get into parallel play mode. And uh, I'm on my computer. He's reading his magazine. And that's how it goes for two hours until it becomes time as we get close to New York. I'm sorry. Let's see what's going on here. Just low. Okay, great. Thanks. I'm an old rock and roll singer, so I could probably carry the room without the thing if we need to. So. <laughs> um, anyway, so we're, so we're in parallel play mode. I'm working on a deck that I have for a presentation I'm giving the next day, and he's reading his magazine. And until the pilot comes on and says it's time for initial descent to New York. And people who fly regularly know this is when airplane chat starts, because it's now safe to talk to the person next to you. You're not going to get roped into a conversation with a maniac for two hours that you can't get away from, right? <laughs> So I turned to him and I say, what takes you to New York? And he says, I have a professional meeting. I said, really, what do you do? Thinking, you know, car dealership. He says, I'm a radiologist. It's like, boom, there goes that picture. You know? And in my, frankly, embarrassment that after professionally doing diversity work for over 30 years, I'm still stereotyping people, um, I say, well, what kind of radiology? And he gets really animated. He says, you'll probably be really interested in this because I couldn't help but look at your deck. He says, we're using functional magnetic resonating imagery, and we actually see what part of the brain responds when people interact with different kinds of people. In other words, he's doing exactly the thing I'm the most interested in. And had I not pegged him as angry Santa, the car mechanic, I talked to him earlier, I probably could have saved myself three months of research on my book. <laughs> so I tell you that because we're going to be talking about a subject here that's not about you, it's about us. This is what we do as human beings. I mean, is there anybody who hasn't had a moment like I just described, where you completely mispeg somebody? You started to act towards them or relate to them in a particular way only to find out that they were completely different than you thought they were or they represented something different or because of the way you, they were dressed, you made something up about them only to find out that they were something else. So this is the nature of how human beings relate. And so this is what I want to unpack with you a little bit today, but I want to start by putting it in context of what's going on around us because I think it's important to not just talk about this theoretically but in real life because we're living right now in what I would call a state of disunion. 
And this is not a unique thought. Most of us know this, and I know some of you who are younger don't see it in quite the historical context of those of us who have been around for a long time, but, but you know, we get farther and farther and farther apart, and it's becoming harder and harder to talk across those differences. But I want to talk, I want to point out some of those differences and how they're playing out to kind of set the table for us before I get into the conversation about bias, because it's important in our listening to this. So I want to talk, first of all, how is it showing up in, in terms of the racial divide? So I just have some numbers we have up here. You know, the first one, um, that hundreds of schools have been released from court-ordered desegregation plans since the 1990s. So we now have hundreds of schools around the United States that had desegregation plans that have now fallen back to, to sort of whatever shows up, shows up. And this is occurring, it, it, what's beginning to happen is we're seeing a resegregation of schools. That the segregation of schools today is about where it was in the 1960s. We haven't moved very far from that. We kind of moved and then came back. Here's the second one. That according to the Government Accounting Office, the number of high poverty schools serving primarily black and brown students has more than doubled since 2000. That's just in the last 17 years. It's more than doubled. This is obviously something having to do with both race and socioeconomic status. Um, that the proportion of schools segregated by race and class, and that is they're defined by at least 75% of the children receive at least receive free lunches, or more than 75 are black or Hispanic, climb from 9 to 16% during that same period of time, during that same 16-year period, or 17-year period. So this is happening very fast. This is not a slow progression. It's happening quite dramatically. But the average white family has more than seven times the wealth of the average black family, according to the Economic Policy Institute. This is the racial divide that we're living in today. And it's important. This is not about making anybody feel wrong or bad personally. It's about understanding the background that has us see the world the way we see it. Okay. Um, that when we look at unemployment, we can see this is the unemployment breakdown. That Asian unemployment is about 3.5%. White unemployment about 3.7%. Hispanic and Latino up to 47 Black or African American, 7.3%. This is as of the last unemployment statistics that came out. Um, a month and a half ago, the last ones that they had this data for. Um, that blacks are 2.8 times more likely to be killed by the police. Hispanics are 1.7 times more likely to be killed by the police than, than white folks, according to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And in 1972, just 25% of black students in the South attended schools with more than 90% people of color. Today, that number is over 50%. So once again, we're looking at the resegregation of schools. According to Forbes, only 4.5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are people of color. So those are the numbers that we see. Now, we could do more, and I could also talk about gender, of course, and I could talk about you know, there are lots of differences. Um, but this is the condition we're living in around this particular area. Now, race, we know, is not the only issue. We also know that politics is an issue. We'll get to that in a minute. Pew did a study. They, they tracked perceptions of race. And here's where we start to see a really interesting difference. So the numbers are what the numbers are, but what are our perceptions of those numbers? Now, I'm sorry this is a little bit blurry, um, but you can see what they, the question they asked was, do you think that blacks suffer discrimination in these various areas? And so you can see the numbers here. In dealing with the police, whites 50%, 84% of blacks. In the courts, 43% to 75%. When applying for a loan or mortgage, you can see it's more than double, 66 to 25 percent. In the workplace, almost triple, 22 to 64 percent. In stores or restaurants, 21 to 49. When voting in elections, 20 to 43 percent. I call this the belonging gap. That there's a gap in our experience, not only what's happening, but in our perception of what's happening. Now, one of the challenges we have with this is because bias has been used almost as a hammer, like you're biased or you're biased, Rather than look at, wow, how might this information be affecting the way we see the world, we, of course, are defensive. And we have a natural defense of this. We know that we wake up in the morning, and very few people I know wake up in the morning and say, how can I suppress the women and people of color around me today? It doesn't occur that way, does it? It's a much more intuitive process. We're drawn toward certain people. We're drawn away from other people. We feel more comfortable with certain people. We attribute um, various different um, uh, expectations on certain people, that this person will be brighter than or, or sharper than or work harder than or any of these distinctions. These are inherently in our emotional system. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about how this plays out in just a little bit. And, of course, we know that hate crimes are on the increase. We now have 917 groups that have actually been identified by the Southern Poverty Law Center as uh, 
as uh, hate crime groups now. One of the things that's happening in this regard, of course, is served by social media in that it used to be that guy who was standing in the mall sort of cussing and spitting people, at spitting people, the kind of weird guy, now can go online and find 2,000 people like him around the country. And they form a group and they feed. And, and part of this that's really important for us to recognize is that we have a fundamental need to belong. In fact, what our research is showing now is that, um, how many people know what Maslow's hierarchy was, is? Yeah, so, so for those of you who don't, Abraham Maslow created model in 1943. Um, and what he did was he, he looked at the hierarchy of human needs. And, he, and what he discovered was that you could kind of see that human beings need certain things at certain levels. So we mostly start with our physiological needs and then our needs for safety, then our need for belonging. Um, uh, I just drew a blank on the fourth one. The last one is self-actualization. So we, we find that basically what, what he's saying was if you're starving to death, you're not going to sit around contemplating what life is like. You're going to be out looking for food. Well, the interesting thing that we're finding now in the neuroscience behind this is that Maslow was probably wrong, that belonging is our key human need. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. You know, what's the most vulnerable time in a human being's existence? Yeah, a newborn baby. Exactly. A newborn baby can't live unless they belong to somebody. Whether it's mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, or the orphanage, somebody's got to be there to take care of that baby. And so our first imprint in life, arguably for the first couple of years of our life, is I exist because you exist. We don't have any sense of even independently seeing ourselves until, of course, the terrible twos happen. Anybody here who's had children knows what happens when they learn that they can say no. You know, my, my granddaughter just went through that. It's, it, you know, it's, you're on the borderline between having to toe the line and just laughing because they're so damn cute when they do it. But, you know, um, when we go through that period, we start to see that, but we hold on to this throughout our lives. And what we're seeing now is that pain of social exclusion and the need to belong is a prime driver of human behavior. It's no accident that almost every time one of these terrible incidents happen, like Sandy Hook, Columbine, or um, Charleston, or any of these, these horrible things happen, what's the first word you almost always hear used to describe the person? Loner, right? Almost every time. That fear of isolation causes external anger and pain. It can also be internalized. It's one of the reasons why four times as many gay teenagers commit suicide, because that separation can even be from one's own family in some cases. So belonging is key. Now, we don't only belong relative to racial groups, but what's happening now is our political life is segmenting. And of course, all of these things cut across the barrier. Cut across the barrier. So, so just as one example, uh, these, the people at the Cook, at, um, Cook Political Report have this measurement they use. They call it the Whole Foods Cracker Barrel divide. <laughs> and the reason, this, the reason this actually ends up being a viable political tool or a viable tool for studying politics is because when you look around the country, everybody, anybody doesn't know what Whole Foods Markets is? Yeah, so Whole Foods is a, a natural foods organic market. It's the largest one in the country. They have like 500 or 460 stores or something all around the United States. And those stores, not surprisingly, generally are in liberal enclaves. Um, they generally draw people who are more on the liberal side. And then there's Cracker Barrel, which tends to draw people on the conservative side. So they've been tracking this now since the 1992 political um, uh, presidential race. And it's fascinating what they found. In 1992, when Bill Clinton won, there was a 21% gap between people, how people voted who were living in these two areas. Four years later, that gap had grown to 25%. Four years after that, it had grown to 32%. Four years after that, 40%. In 2008, it was 45%. And in 2012, it had grown to 48%. We, they, haven't, they haven't published the numbers yet for this, for this last election. But think about what that's saying. We're living in more segregated political enclaves in this country than we have in anybody's recorded memory. We're living with people who agree with us. And not only, of course, are we living with people who agree with us, but we're also communicating with people who agree with us across social media. So we could begin to look at that. Now, we see the results of this. We could just look at this map and see how these results sh show up in terms of the geography of it. But let's look at what happens in politics. Now, I take this back to 1972. I grew up in the Vietnam War era, which was arguably, you know, close to as conflictual as the era we're in now. I would say that we're actually more conflict now than we were there, even though that was pretty tense. And the reason is this. This is what the political spectrum looked like. 
You know, mostly Republicans, red indicates Republicans, blue Democrats here. Mostly Republicans were on the conservative side, but you had still some liberal Republicans in the party, and the same is true on the Democratic side. You had, for example, um, where civil rights were concerned, you had some conservative Democrats who, who weren't supporters of civil rights. You had some liberal Republicans who were, the Northeastern Republicans, notably what we used to call the Rockefeller Republicans in those days. Um, similarly, on the war in Vietnam, mostly Democrats were against the war, but you had Scoop Jackson Democrats who were, um, who were for the war, or, um, or Republicans were mostly supportive of the war, but you had the Mark Hatfield Democrats and, and um, you know, Paul McCluskey Demo uh, Republicans, rather, who were against the war. So, so largely, in this model, what we had was an issue-driven paradigm. And that is, based on whatever issue, you had this bell curve, and based on whichever issue it was, oh, I'll team up with you on this issue, but you and I are in different places. But then on the other issue, maybe I team up with you, and you and I are in different places. And this was the basic political model. So it was a political model that was built on compromise and finding places to work together, because we weren't ideologically pure. We've switched from a bell curve to a dumbbell curve. This is what it looks like now. The most conservative Democrat is more liberal than the most liberal Republican. And what that means is we're no longer issue oriented because they are over there and we're over here, whichever side of the equation you particularly find yourself on. So we've gone from an issue driven paradigm to an identity driven paradigm. And this is incredibly dangerous to our social fabric because it's one thing if we're talking about issues. I can share my idea with you, you share your idea with me, we dig into the issue, we try to figure out who's right or wrong, we bring extra data in, we come to some resolution. But when I've now identified you as the other, it doesn't matter what you say, because you're not one of me. And in fact, this is what we're seeing. That when we evaluate people based on issues, it's impersonal. When we evaluate people based on, identify, on identity, we objectify them. You're now a Clinton supporter or a Trump supporter. And I now have a whole list of associations with that. I now know you. I know what to expect from you. I know what to be afraid of from you. I know where you're stupid or where you're harsh or whatever characteristics I want to give to that group. And I will tend to stereotype more because when you're all in a group, I'll tend to stereotype you in that way. And so dialogue begins to break down. This is why you're at a really fortunate place, because being in a university, you do have the context for creating dialogue like this. The other thing is that because we're voting with our identities, we're inherently less able to compromise and inherently take the campaign and election more personally. You know, it's not about something happened that I disagree with. It's that I was rejected. Everything I believe in was rejected. How many of you can relate to that in terms of life, like you've seen people or you felt that way yourself? Yeah, it's a very personal thing. And that's not to say that people weren't disappointed before, but the depth of disappointment about not getting the issue that you want is very different than the depth of disappointment about people like you being rejected. And, this is, and, and it's important for us to get this and really experience it in our own bodies. Now, one big impact of this is the media. I can give you an example, Jim Comey's testimony. Now, Comey testified in front of the Senate. Some of you probably heard about that. And a researcher followed him, um, followed the testimony, and watched the three, sta three main stations, cable stations that were covering it, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. And they tracked the, um, the uh, chirons, which run under the screen. You know, the chirons are the ticker tape that runs under the screen. Now, this is usually how people, um, people or news outlets kind of focus people in a certain direction. They say, he made that point. Did you hear that point? So they tracked him on the, three, on the three different stations, and here's what they found. Comey mentioned twice during his testimony that the president had or might lie. He was concerned about the president. CNN mentioned that 34 times. Fox had only nine references. MSNBC had 49. Um, Senator Manchin asked, asked Comey, do you believe this rises to obstruction of justice? To which Comey replied, I don't know. That's Bob Mueller's job to sort out. CNN had two related to that, Fox 17, MSC, MSNBC 23. Comey said that he took POTUS's word, words asking to stop the probe as directive. CNN ran that 21 times, MSC, MSNBC twice, Fox not at all. And then the last one, I could go more, but I just put a, a selection out. 
He said that nobody outwardly asked him to top the probe. CNN didn't run any Chiron regarding this. Fox ran it in two variations, 36 times. MSNBC ran it twice. So the question is, who were you watching? We're being brainwashed. And it's a function of the structure of media today. Because media no longer has to reach a wide market. You see, it used to be, you know, years ago, we would watch TV, and there were basically three sources of news. And it was all kind of homogenized, because all the news stations were looking for the broadest possible market. So you couldn't take a strong position, because you'd turn off the other side. So you had to tell basically the news, and you had to back off from interpretations. And the interpretation was left to the people who were watching. So we got the news. Now we don't watch the news. We watch people watching the news. Have you noticed this? You turn on the news after a big event, and what do you find? A panel of people who are there to tell you what to believe about what you just saw. And everybody said, we were talking about this in one of the sessions earlier, I said, everybody always says to me, yeah, I wish we had a news station that we could watch where we just got the news. And we do. It's called the PBS News Hour. But nobody, <laughs> nobody watches it. It's probably the only place on TV that you can see it consistently, and yet nobody watches it. You know, so this is the nature of what we see. Now what happens is we get news, we watch a station, and it gets pre-interpreted and then given to us. So one group is getting one set of news, and the other group is getting another set of news. If you leave here today, this time with me, with anything else or nothing else, what I hope you'll leave with is start watching multiple news sources. As painful as it is, whichever side of the equation you're on, even if you have to sit there and tie your hands so that you don't throw something at the screen, really, just as an experiment, take it on for a while. It will blow your mind how differently stories are covered. And how we're being shaped by this. Now, I didn't even talk about how social media now feeds that because we have all of our friends who agree with us, who send us the blogs that we read. We have our Twitter feed with the people who we see. Um, we defriend people or unfriend people if they're too disagreeable with us, right? And at some point, we're living in an echo chamber. And all of this is critical to understand when we begin to talk about bias, because th this particularly impacts racial attitudes. Let me show you what I mean. This is a clip from a newscast that was shown in Chicago about two years ago. Meantime, two teenagers are wounded. Well, let me turn the volume up a little bit. I'm sorry. There we go. Meantime, two teenagers are wounded on the city's south side. It happened at East 74th as an 18-year-old man and 16-year-old girl were hit while standing on the sidewalk. The male's in good condition while the girl's expected to recover. And kids on the street, as young as four, were there to see it all unfold and had a disturbing reaction. No, I'm not scared of nothing. When What's you get that? older, you gonna stay away from all these guns? No. No? No. What do you want to do when you get older? I'm gonna have me a gun. You because I live right here and I don't want none of my family members to get shot. Right. That is very scary indeed. So far, no suspects are in custody. Yeah, it's very scary and it's upsetting, especially that little four year old boy. It's really upsetting, isn't it? Let me show you something that's a little bit more upsetting. This is another film of that same interview with the little boy taken by a bystander with their cell phone. That's what I like to hear. You ain't scared of nothing. Damn. When you get older, you gonna stay away from all these guns? No. No? No. What do you want to do when you get older? I'm gonna have me a gun. You are? Why do you want to do that? You know what happens when I'm gonna be the police. Okay, well then, then you can have... A little different narrative, isn't it? How many times has that happened without us realizing it? I can tell you, I do a lot of media work, and I've had people stand right next to me and be interviewed and seen them seem to, fortunately, I've never been misquoted, but I've seen people literally sitting right next to me when they took a piece of what they said out and used it in a completely different context. Now, I'm not saying this to trash the media, because they're great, the media's like everybody else, they're great reporters who are diligent, professional, do their jobs brilliantly, and there are others who don't. But the point is, are we, keeping track of what we're being exposed to. Because what we know about human beings is that when people are asked to solve a problem together, they tend to move towards solutions. When people are asked to solve a problem in separate places, they move towards polarity. 
So if you have Democrats or Republicans, you put them together and you say, come up with a solution, they'll tend to come up with a solution. They'll tend to moderate. They'll tend to move towards the middle. But if one's over here and one's over here, they'll move towards the extremes. And this is the challenge we have with this segregation, So, which is, a, which is where we want to get to now is we talk about what does this tell us about the way we think? Because we don't think the way we think we think. Now, if there's an English professor here, they'll probably get me for that sentence, but I like it anyway. We don't think the way we think we think. We think we're rational as human beings. But what we're learning is that we think mostly in, that most of our opinions come from our intuitive, emotional reaction first, and then we gather information to prove that point of view to ourselves. So let's take a look just one thing. Can we lower the lights just for these two video clips I'm going to show just because I want people to really be able to see them? Is that possible? Thank you. Because the fundamental question behind our biases is, is this one. How much do we really know? Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. <laughs> it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Good, so you can put the lights back on if you'd like. So how many of the educated, intelligent, capable, bright people in this room saw more than two or three changes? Just raise your hand if you saw more than two or three changes. Right? All this stuff going on in front of you that you don't notice. Now, this is fascinating because... You know, we generally tend to think, how many of you have been in a situation where something happened? You were in a group, you were in a classroom, or something happened. Somebody said something, and you're feeling, wow, that was a bit off. Like there was something a little bit offensive or something. And you walk out of the room, and you say to somebody, did you hear that? And they say, what are you talking about? How many of you had something like that happen? In your family, it can happen too, right? <laughs> and what do you do? What do you do when that happens? Don't you usually say, well, you should have seen it. You know? But in fact, we see very little of what's in front of us. We're exposed to about 11 million pieces of information at any one time, data points. Right now, we're exposed to 11 million data points. We can absorb about 40 or 50. So we're constantly cherry picking. and We see the things that are important to us. We see the things that we're used to looking at. We pay attention to things that we're good at or interested in. You know, my, um, I, I really was a rock and roll music, lead singer of a rock and roll band for 30 years. And, um, and so my wife and I are listening to a piece of music. And she'll say, wow, that's a great song. And I'm listening to how the bass is supporting the drums and where the, the, the backup guitar is coming in over the lead guitar and all this kind of stuff. And then we go to an art museum because she's a watercolorist. And we're looking at a painting and she says, wow, look at the coloration here and how they shadowed here and I'm pretty picture. <laughs> Who can relate to this? You've got something in your life that you can't help but see it, you know. Um, and then other people miss the entire thing. This is the nature of the way the mind works. We see certain things and not others. And of course, we also relate to people differently as we see the things that we see based on our different values. So this is a little clip from an ABC News uh, study that we'll look at. He's the boss. She's bossy. The negative way women are perceived at the office in a new ad for Pantene that's gone viral. It's hit a nerve, so we set out to find the truth. 
Are women who act exactly the same as men seen differently? Listen to this woman. How do you feel about her as a job candidate? I know the Windows operating systems like the back of my hand, no problem. Now, listen to him. I know the Windows operating systems like the back of my hand, no problem. The candidates in these videos are actors in a Yale University hiring experiment. The resumes, identical. The interviews, identical. I'm extremely good, good at sizing, sizing up people quickly and then delegating responsibility, responsibility accordingly. accordingly. The only difference is gender. But when it comes to who got the job? I thought the male applicant had better soft skills. I'd say the woman was um, arrogant and overselling. In hundreds of evaluations, the female job seekers come off as more aggressive, are rated less likable, and they're less likely to be hired. Isn't it a catch-22? You're supposed to be strong to get that job, mm -hmm. and you're saying if you're too strong, you won't get it. You need to behave in this dominant way to advance as a woman in the workplace but you're seen negatively because that's not how we expect women to behave. And if you think this is just male bias, it's not. Both men and women doing the hiring made the same call. I think there's a level of arrogance that becomes, that might be okay to be a manager, but then there's a step above, and I thought she was slightly above that. So let's talk. And when we revealed our study results? I was surprised by my uh, reaction. What does that say about us? We have a long way to go. Yes. Now, this same phenomenon occurs in lots of different ways. For example, the Veterans Administration did a study of doctors who were going into coding situations. You know, like an ER, when the doctor comes into the emergency room, takes over the room, it's not a time for consensus leadership. You know, the doctor comes in and says, you do this, you do this, stat, get that, you know, that sort of a thing. So they tracked male and female doctors who came in and did that. What they found was when male doctors did it, they left feeling pretty good about themselves. You know, they got a lot of positive feedback for saving the patient's life and all that. When female doctors behaved in exactly the same way, not only did they get called the B word for what they were, how they were acting, but they went afterwards and apologized to people for their behavior. Now think about that for a minute, how internalized that is. They so expected to be castigated for their behavior, judged negatively for their behavior, that they were apologizing for it. Even though they were doing exactly the same thing that men did. And it's important for us to realize it's not that people say, you shouldn't act that way, only men should act that way. It's not that rational. It's just we feel differently when we see a woman acting that way. We're used to seeing men act that way. It fits with the stereotype of how men are supposed to be in our culture. Kick ass and take names. That's the way we make things happen. For a woman who does that gets this other association. This is the nature of the way the mind works. So I want to talk a little bit about how the brain actually does this because as my friend Sukhvinder Obi, who's at McMaster University in Canada, says, our brains seem to have evolved to be good enough most of the time. This is what our brains are doing. Our brains are constantly looking and judging, guessing what's going on around us. And we've got voluminous studies now, over 1,500 studies in the last 10 years alone, about how this shows up in, bi in action as bias. So just a couple of them. I'm not going to try to get 1,500 in. This one was done by um, some researchers, gave law firm partners in Chicago a memo that was supposedly written by a guy named Thomas Meyer. It intentionally had 22 different kind of errors in it. They were alternately told that Thomas Meyer was white or black. When they were told that he was white, they, found, they rated the memo 4.1 out of 5, on average found 10.2 errors. This Thomas Meyer has potential good analytic skills, generally good writer, but needs to work on such and such. When they were told the exact same memo was written by a person of the exact same name, but who was black, the score dropped to 3.2. 40% more errors were found. And here are some of the comments. He needs a lot of work. Average at best. Can't believe he went to NYU. Now, one of the statistics on this board that's the most interesting to me, and I think the most important, is this one. 40% more errors found. How does that happen? Well, think about it. You find what you're looking for. There was a study done at Yale University just about a year ago. Some of you may have seen it because it got some national play. They took preschool teachers. Anybody see the study? They had them watch a video of four students, two white and two black, one a boy and one a girl, in a preschool environment. They were watching the screen. They were told to look for challenging behavior on the part of the students. They said there may or may not be challenging behavior, but they wanted them to look for it. What the teachers who were watching, and by the way, teachers of all races, who were watching them, didn't know was that the screen they were watching had eye tracking technology. They have this laser technology now where they can see where people's eyes are looking on the screen. The teachers were 40% more likely to look at the black children when they were told to look for challenging behavior. And what are the implications of that? 
you know, some of us have seen this in our own family. Some of you have multiple children, especially if they've gotten past teen. I'm speaking, obviously, to the older folks in the room. For those of us who have teenagers, you know, you got the child who's the constant problem. They're always, they, they all, you always keep an eye on them, right? The other ones are fine, but you always keep an eye on them. Who's the one who ends up smoking dope outside? It's the one you weren't watching. You know, this is what, this is what uh, the nature of, of what happens. And it happens in classrooms with students all, as well. You know, we create what, what's sometimes called the halo or horns effect. We look for the golden child who we know is bright, so therefore we don't think much about it when, you know, if, if something doesn't go well, we say, gee, maybe they didn't understand. And then we have the other ones, no matter what they do, they come in with a brilliant paper. I wonder if somebody helped them with this. You know, so we're screening what we see by the nature of our biases. Here's another one, height and leadership. Study in Sweden showed at 1.3 million men found that taller men more likely to become CEOs, more likely to be paid more as CEOs. In the United States, even though only 14% of men are over six foot tall, 60% of CEOs are over six foot tall, and an inch of height is worth about $800 per year. In the presidential race, over the course of American history, the taller candidate has won the U.S. presidency two-thirds of the time, and yet nobody talks about this. Think about the pain it could save us. Instead of doing the primaries, we just line people up, take the taller person, and move on. <laughs> now, personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with this one. But that's, yeah. um, <laughs> and here's another one. This is, from, this is also from some researchers at Yale. They gave science professors a prospective resume for a lab assistant. Everything was the same, except some were named John and some were named Jennifer. When it was John, he was rated four, point at 4 out of 7 as opposed to 3.3 .3 for Jennifer. John was on average offered $4,000 more in salary. He was seen as more likely to hire. But here's where it gets interesting. Female professors made exactly the same choices as male professors did. So this is not just about the other. We internalize these biases, even about people like ourselves. The key here is this is what human beings do. There's one more I've got for you. This one is actually a whole collection. Um, researchers at uh, MIT and uh, University of Chicago sent a resume out to companies that, they sa that said that they were looking for hiring more people of color. These were companies that had affirmative hiring practices. The res resumes were identical except for the names on the resume. Some were what they called traditionally white names. Gregory and Emily, for example, were two they choose, chose. Some of them were more traditionally African-American names. Lakeisha and Jamal were two they chose, for example. The ones, the same exact resume with white names were 50% more likely to be called in by companies that were looking for diversity in hiring. These were companies that had conscious affirmative action practices and still it was affected in this way. And subsequently, the same study was repeated in Singapore with Chinese-based surnames, in Sweden with Swedish-based surnames, and in the UK with Anglo versus Muslim names. Even the name triggers this in us. You know, I feel like this should be an Oprah moment. You've got bias, you've got bias, you've got bias, you've got bias, you've got, we've all got bias. This is the nature of, of what's true about us. And, and it's important for us to recognize that we've created this sort of bias equals badness paradigm. But the truth is bias can be as valuable to us as it can be dangerous to us. The mechanism of bias is in and of itself benign. It's how it's played out that's the problem. So the same mechanism, for example, that can have you spot danger and actually keep yourself safe because you were able to pick up something quickly that was dangerous. Let's say somebody looking at you, you know, in a glowering way across the room and starting to walk to you, you get to protect yourself. Is the same mental mechanism, the same psychological mechanism that has a police officer pull that gun and shoot that person who's innocent. The, the mechanism is the same. And so I want to take that apart a little bit, but first to recognize that I could give you examples, like we just saw, about virtually every distinction of human identity that you can imagine. I mean, literally, I could give you a study about all of these. What it's teaching us is the question is not, do you have bias? The question is, which are yours? Now, this is important, because on one hand, on one hand, we can hear that and we can say, well, gee, that's a little depressing. You know, I don't want to have bias. And it could be, but actually, it could be quite liberating. Because if we really get that we have bias all the time, then we can start paying attention to it. And when we pay attention to it, we can start managing it. See, if I know that I have a tendency to like one particular group versus another group, then I can say, I've got to be careful if I'm interviewing two people from those groups. Because if I interview somebody, if I hire somebody just because, you know, they remind me of some kid I went to school with, 
It's not only unfair to the other person, but it's also a stupid way to make a talent management decision because I might as well be rolling the dice to determine if I got the right choice. So let's break this down a little bit. Let's look at what function does bias serve? Why do you think we have bias? Yeah. It's comfortable. That's one thing. Absolutely. We get into habits of the certain kinds of people we know we're comfortable with. What's another? What's the core reason underneath that? Yeah. Safety. You know, it probably goes back thousands of years when we were living in caves and jungles. You saw a group of people around the waterhole. You had to know whether it was us or them. If you made the wrong decision, you died. This has a tendency to focus people's behavior. Right? So we learn to make quick decisions about people. Where do I belong and where do I not belong? And we feel comfortable with the people who we're used to being with and less comfortable with the people we're not used to being with. And this is encoded into us as human beings. There's no question that that's the case. It's kind of like our human danger detector. And we can see sort of how this plays out in the brain. So, um, so if you look at brain men up here, something happens out here, some catalyzing person or circumstance. So, what's your first name? Carrie. Carrie. So I'm choosing Carrie just because she's wearing this red sort of sweater, whatever it is, right? So let's say I see Carrie, and for the first time, and I have a reaction like something about this woman makes me feel uncomfortable. That's not true. I'm just making this up, so don't take it personally. <laughs> What's actually happening is I'm not seeing Carrie at all. I'm seeing her through the context of a background of experience that I've had. And that background of experience is shaping what I see. Now, let's say it's something like when I was a kid, we used to have, um, uh, when I was in like what they call middle school now, then we called it junior high school, we had sock hops. We literally danced in our socks because they wanted to protect the gym floor in those days. you know. And, so the, and of course, since, since in those days, I'm talking 50 plus years ago, um, there was nothing but heterosexuality ever talked about. The way it would be, the boys would line up on one side of the room and the girls would line up on the other side of the room, and it was always the boy's job to ask the girls to dance. So let's just say, I'm just making this up, but let's say there's a girl named Sally in my, in my class who I had a crush on, and this was my big chance. I was going to declare my interest. I was going to boldly walk across the room to ask her to dance. I walk across the room and ask her to dance, and not only does she say no, but she laughs at me. And in front of all of my friends, I've got to walk all the way back. And the whole time I'm saying to myself, I am never doing that again. She was wearing a red sweater. And in my brain, red sweater and rejection get linked unconsciously. And here I am now, 50 years later, I meet Carrie, and that gets triggered. That button gets pushed. How many of you have met somebody in seconds, something about them made you feel uncomfortable? Yeah, anybody who's not raising their hand hasn't been paying attention. <laughs> of course, it can happen any other way, too. It can happen somebody, and what's your name? Duncan. Duncan. So I meet Duncan, and Duncan, and I say, hey, he seems like a good guy within five seconds. How can it be about Duncan? I've only been with him for five seconds. I don't even know him yet. Maybe he reminds me of a guy I played ball with when I was in junior high school or something. You know, who knows? But this is the way the mind works. Now, we know what happens. The first signal goes to the fast brain, the limbic system, which is this green area. It's kind of like if you imagine my hand as a brain, like this, it's like in where the thumb would be. It's actually, more accurately, it would be if I had two thumbs, but that'd be kind of weird, right? But, uh, and the limbic system includes a couple of, you know, organs. One, the amygdala. Most everybody's heard something about the amygdala because it's had as big a decade as Brangelina, I think. You know, every time you turn around, you see a story about the amygdala. Think of the amygdala in simplified terms as sort of a, um, a radar system. You know, constantly scanning. If you were to design a brain and evolve it over thousands of years, would you have it be more sensitized to danger coming your way or reward? Danger, of course. Because reward comes and, you're not, and you don't expect it. Nice surprise. Danger comes and you don't expect it dead. So we're highly sensitized to danger. And some people, some neuroscientists suggest that it may take as much as 20% more brain energy, energy to see something positive or something negative. Because we want to screen out what's dangerous before we see what's positive. So quickly sends a signal to the hippocampus, which is the main memory center of the brain. It's like running over to the file cabinet. Red sweater, red sweater, red sweater. Ah, Sally. <laughs> and then to the hypothalamus, which is like the air traffic controller of the brain, tells me what to do. Oh, hi, Carrie. That whole process takes 0.2 milliseconds. 0.2 milliseconds. And that's the way the fast brain works. Now, incredibly valuable to us. If you were driving your car here this morning and somebody stopped short in front of you and their taillights come on, you do not want to go to, whoops. You do not want to go to your slow brain and and say, oh, what should I do here? You'll end up in their back seat, right? Your fast brain hits sends a message to your foot to hit the brake before you even think about it. This is why, by the way, it's really important that when people are learning to drive for the first year, they drive more slowly until their brain gets a chance to get that automatic behavior in. 
So the fast brain is incredibly valuable. Now the slow brain, I'll continue. The slow brain, getting back to this model, which by the way I borrowed from Dan Siegel at UCLA, is this part of the brain. Most remarkable part, of, arguably, of human anatomy. The prefrontal cortex of the brain, this is what we call the slow brain, um, is it, in human beings is anywhere from three to five times larger per body size, depending upon who's whose estimates you see, and also about the same amount more active than in other animals. I mean, there are some animals, higher level primates and orca whales and the like, that have some prefrontal capacity, but nothing like ours. This gives us the capacity to say, what made me think about that? And that's an unremarkable thought for a human being. How many of you have had dogs, though? You put your dog in the backyard and it sees a squirrel. Do you have any sense to say, should I chase that squirrel? <laughs> squirrel, right? We have the capacity to say, does it make sense for me to chase this squirrel right now? Now, that doesn't mean we always use it, but it's this, it's this part of the brain. Oh, here we go. We're back here. This part of the brain, which, um, which is actually where our capacity to be conscious lives. This is what gives us consciousness. This is what gives us the ability to, to step outside of our biases, to act despite our biases might be a good way to put it. And I can show you real quickly how the two parts work together. I'm going to show you a series of letter combinations. And don't worry about what they say. Some will be words and some won't. All I want you to do is speak out loud the color of the font that you see. Okay, so let's practice. Okay, I'm going to go fast. See if you can keep up. Here we go. Okay, great. Let's try it again. Here we go. <laughs> what happened? Did you feel that tug of war? You feel that tug of war in your brain? That's a tug of war between your fast and slow brain. I gave you a very simple slow brain instruction. You had no problem with it. But then what happened was the second time, despite what I told you, you gave yourself a fast brain instruction. It's the one you've been learning since you were two or three or however old you were when mom or dad started to teach you that there were words. Right? It's an automatic response. Now, it's funny when we see this, but how can it show up? Let's say I'm interviewing somebody for a job. And a woman of color comes in and I say to myself, and I mean, I'm not talking about somebody who's BSing. I mean, I really mean this. This is exciting. We need more women of color in leadership in our organization. And I am really, really excited that this woman is here. And then I start interviewing her, and at the same time, I say, yeah, but you know, she just doesn't have the executive presence I'm looking for. Because the fast brain has made an association between leadership and people who look like this. And even though consciously I really want to do that, my fast brain, my biases are, in, are implied there. And you've seen this happen. You've seen people who you talk to, you really like, and somebody comes up with some cockamamie reason why they don't like them. It makes no sense, no rationality, because it's not rational. They're simply trying to describe a feeling that was there, putting some words so they come up with some excuse that's not there. Now, now, as long as we think that only bad people do this, we lose our ability to deal with it in ourselves, because none of us want to be bad. We don't want to think that we're bad. And most of us, like I said, don't wake up in the morning wanting to do this with people. So if we could create more space for us to own the biases and realize that they're there, then we can then we can possibly look and say, wow, it wasn't intentional that I feel this way, but I do feel this way, so I want to be responsible for that. See, because we don't see the same world. We actually have an internalized book of rules that we've learned throughout our lives. So, for example, how did you know to do that? What's your first name? <laughs> Kyle. So, to Kyle's, how do you know to do that? Because that's what we do around here, right? How did my handshake feel? A little bit. <laughs> You see, I intentionally didn't shake Kyle's hand like we usually do in American culture, which is more like a wrestling match. I'm damn glad to meet you, you know. I shook his hand like they do in about a third of the world. About a third of the world shakes hands dramatically softer than we do. If you go to the Middle East or most parts of Asia or some parts of South America, for example, people shake hands much more softly. Some of those places think that the way Americans shake hands is dominating. But you notice... It has, a, it has a, an association with it. It's not just less pressure, is it? You all laughed when he said limp because it meant something. It had a value. How many of you have heard, I know some of you are probably have never, don't have a lot of business experience, but how many of you have heard somebody say, if somebody shakes hands like that with me at the beginning of an interview, forget it, the interview might as well be over, right? Think about how crazy that is. And yet it's a great window into our mind. I could come from another culture. I could have an injury to my hand. I could be recovering from an injury to my hand. 
I could have a disability that has my hand be weakened, none of which has anything to do with 99% of the jobs I might get unless my job is squeezing one of those hand squeezers all day. <laughs> and yet this is the way we, we make decisions. And we do the same thing around race, around gender, around body size and shape, sexual orientation, whatever distinct age, Whatever distinction you have, this is how we make these decisions on a visceral level. Just like his experience, the feeling. Now, yours was pretty tame, Kyle. I was working with some leadership team of FEMA a couple years ago, and I did that with one of the guys who was the head of their uh, fire division who was built like a football linebacker. And he practically <laughs> fell off his chair. He had sort of this kind of reaction to it. You know? So this is the So we have this internalized book of rules, and the book of rules give us schema. Schema are framing mechanisms that have us see certain things and not others. But schema can change. I'll show you. Take a look at this picture. And just raise your hand if you see anything recognizable in this picture. Obviously, if you've seen it before, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody see anything recognizable? Some people are mouthing it, but they're just not willing to say it out loud. Okay. I'm going to show you, I'm going to overlay what's actually there so you can see it more clearly. So, it's actually a picture of a cow. Does everybody now see the cow? So two ears, two eyes, a nose, the forehead, okay? Anybody who doesn't see the cow, we could do a remedial session afterwards. So. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to take off the superimposed picture, go back to the original picture, and tell me now if you can avoid seeing the cow in the original picture. <laughs> right? Something that was invisible, just like that became visible. Who do you think is more likely to observe distinctions in group identity, people who are in the dominant group, and I mean the predominant cultural group, which in the United States generally means white, um, male in business environments, heterosexual, Christian, those are the do predominant cultural groups. Who do you think is more likely to see that group distinction, people in the dominant or the non-dominant groups? Non-dominant groups, of course. Because if you're in a dominant group, for those of us who are white, for example, in a predominantly white culture, we don't have to pay as much attention to race. Because the way of operating is our way of operating. We don't even see it. It's largely invisible to us. People say, well, that's a white way of being. We say, what are you talking about? That's just a way of being. People of color say, oh, it's a white way of being. <laughs> Women will tend to see gender dynamics more than men will. Most of us won't even notice how um, heteronormative our environment is, how much more welcoming it is to people who are heterosexual relative to people who are LGBTQ, and yet, They'll see it all the time. So this is the nature of mind. It doesn't mean you're bad. You can't be oriented towards seeing something that you don't have. Not that you can't be. Let me put it here. You're not as likely to be naturally oriented to seeing something when you don't need that skill. And this is why I, I want to continue to do violence to this bias equals badness paradigm. I'm not, look, I'm not some Pollyanna. I've been doing this for many years, and I've been in some really hot situations. So I'm not saying there aren't bad people out there, because of course there are. But 90% of the things that happen on a daily basis and institutions like this are not because somebody says, I want to get that person. It's because I don't even realize that I'm already automatically evaluating that person in a different way than I'm the person next to them. And we've actually done a disservice by politicizing this issue. Because as soon as we throw diversity into the political crap that we were talking about earlier, excuse me, that's a technical term, um, then what happens is, oh, if I'm on this side, that's a bad thing. If I'm on this side, it's a good thing. The truth is, this is about making good decisions. It's about actually seeing and being with the person who's in front of you. Because what ends up happening is the schema gives us a background, and the background then shapes everything we see. We gather information to, to, to affirm what we already believe. You've seen that with people. They'll, they'll cherry pick information automatically to reinforce what they already know. Because we don't operate like scientists. We operate like lawyers. We're building our case. That's why you can sit with somebody and watch the exact same thing. If, if any of you, you know, still sit with people of the opposite political you know, persuasion and watch something together, which sadly fewer and fewer people are doing, you're watching the debates or something and something happens and you both simultaneously see what I mean to prove opposite points. Because this is the way the mind works. We gather evidence to support it. It's called confirmation bias. Yeah. So it's like a lens. Like imagine you have a contact lens over your eyes. And that concept lens shapes what you see. It happened when you walked in here and you saw me. You immediately had some thought about me based on what you see. It happens when we meet anybody for the first time. And the more familiarity is, the more comfort there is, the more easy it is to be with that person. The less familiarity, the less comfort, the more protected we are. 
we'll, we'll hold back a little bit. So let's look at all of this in the context of this statement. This is obviously a very controversial three words. But we can see this, why we have this controversy in the context of what I'm talking about. Because you see, when we see this, we're not really seeing three words. We're seeing four. The problem is the fourth word is invisible and it's different for two different groups of people. Some people see this and what they see is only Black Lives Matter. And so it occurs as a black nationalist movement or a separatist movement or only thinking about themselves. Other people see the same three words, but this is the fourth word that they see. Black Lives Matter too. But because we don't dig in and find out what are you really seeing here, we assume that we're seeing the same thing. And then we get oppositional about it. And there are, we give a hundred examples. This is just one that we happen to see. So all of this being there, you know, right now, of course, we're dealing with this especially because fearful times, and this is a fearful time, I could argue that since 9-11 we've been in post-traumatic stress as an entire society. The fearful times in intensify us versus them thinking. And the more us versus them thinking happens, the more stereotypes they are. And when we get into a fearful mindset, Daniel Goleman, who's the person who really um, created the field of emotional intelligence and certainly brought it to the public, calls it amygdala hijacking. What happens is the fear center of the brain takes over, and it's almost like the lid gets blown off on our prefrontal cortex. It's like a convertible top that gets caught in the wind and gets torn off. And so we're reacting all the time. And it, this causes a couple of things to happen. One is reactive responses, fight, flight, and freeze, which most of you have heard about. A second is that we look for ways to gain control. And that's either control of ourselves, or often we turn to people who are strong and powerful who we think can save us and keep us, keep us safe. This is why virtually every time in human history when there was a democratic government that got taken over by a totalitarian government, Germany, um, in, this, in the 30s, Italy, uh, the Taliban in, in Afghanistan, almost every time it was, a, it was a, a culture that was in panic. Save us. Usually turn to a man. You know, Big Daddy comes in and saves us. But the other thing that we tend to do is we tend to think that what's around us is pervasive. So we take a real, a real threat among a group of people. There are some people in that group who are dangerous. And what the brain says is, but it could be any of them. It's easier for the frightened mind to say, keep them all away from me, than it is for us to say, I'm going to figure out which ones are safe. And this is exactly where we are right now around Islamophobia in our society. See, it's easier for people to say, keep them all away from me, than it is for me to worry which ones are safe and which ones aren't. And the fearful mind takes over. So we don't stop and think about the repercussions of that. We just act on it because we want to keep ourselves safe. Now, it's hard for us to think, wow, I'm really doing that. It feels, it doesn't feel nice or something. It's just, it is true. This is what happens. This is why any times when people are panicky, they tend to move towards more stereotyping. And so, so it's really important for us to get that this is happening. So why is it that having courageous conversations or critical conversations are important? Because right now, I really believe that the separation in our thinking is more dangerous to us than any particular philosophy or point of view. I mean, philosophies come and philosophies go. We'll go conservative, then we go back to liberal, and throughout our history we've swung the pendulum back and forth. But I can't remember a time in my life when the divide between has been as stark and as separate as it is now. And that's really problematic because, as I said before, when that divide gets that strong, we're no longer dealing with each other's humanity. We've now objectified each other. You're one of those types. It's almost like Yankees Red Sox. I'm <laughs> looking at your hat. <laughs> no. I mean, we, we actually see those people in that way. It's no, we no longer treat people with their individual humanity. And this is why being able to have conversations, like I know some of you were here last time with Cornell and Bob, and they were talking about this. That's why those kinds of conversations are so important, because one of the things we need to do to, in order to break through this is to embrace and explore our fear to really be willing to look, wow, what's scaring me right now? Am I really in danger? I know I feel uncomfortable, but is there anything actually happening out here that's justifying that? Or is it just some memory that's being triggered? And so you don't even have to know what the memory is. For example, when I meet Carrie, if I notice I have an instant reaction when I meet her, something about this woman makes me feel uncomfortable, I can stop and say, okay, she hasn't even done anything yet. 
I don't even know her yet. Obviously, it's triggering something from my past. And just knowing that, and this is actually, by the way, calculable. You can look at it in functional magnetic resonating imagery. The amygdala starts to quiet. The reaction of the amygdala gets quieter. As soon as I say, wow, something's triggering me, just that awareness, turning that awareness inside, makes me more able now to see her for who she is. Now, if I can figure out what it is, then it goes to a whole other level. I was doing a workshop in a law firm in New York City uh, last year, and uh, it was the partners in the law firm were told they had to come to this workshop. And if you tell partners in a law firm they have to do anything, they resent it. If you tell them they have to get ice cream, and they resent it. You know? So the last person that comes in with this woman, and she's a short, dark-haired woman, kind of thin, and white woman. She comes, she sits right at the end of the table, and I found out later she was the, the senior female partner in the firm. She sits down like this. <laughs> and I was triggered. I was completely hooked. I start the workshop, and the first 15 minutes, I'm trying to get her to get enrolled. The whole, and I, I caught myself. I said, something's going on with me. So they were in some kind of exercise, and I stopped. I said, what's going on? And then I realized instantly, as soon as I looked, it's my older sister. She reminded me of my older sister, who happens to also have been a lawyer. My, I love my older sister, but she was four years older than me, so she picked on me a lot when I was a kid, of course. You know? So here I was, 60-plus years old, trying to convince my sister that I knew what I was doing. And as soon as I saw it, I, I almost laughed out loud in the room, and it was gone. Just like that, it was gone. So, so my invitation to you is to start looking inward, to start paying attention to what your reactions are to practice what I call constructive uncertainty, and that is to turn some of our exclamation points into question marks. To not be so sure that we know. Because maybe it's like that whodunit video. Maybe we're missing something. Maybe we're seeing only what we want to see. Maybe we've put the halo on this person or the horns on that person or on that group. You see, is that belief you have about that group of people true? Or is it just what you believe is true? You know, are you willing to explore an alternative explanation? Are you willing to listen to an alternative explanation? And consider it. That doesn't, I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with having strong points of view. I'm just saying that we need to hold our points of view as points of view and not like they're the truth with a capital T. But most of us have no distinction between our point of view and truth. We hold our kind of point of view as, as they are the truth. There's uh, Rollo May, a great... Uh, therapist once said, freedom is the pause between stimulus and response. When we slow ourselves down a little bit, it gives the slow brain a chance to, chick in, to kick in. Now, I'm not saying we can do that about every decision, but with important decisions we can. To consciously slow yourself down. So before you send that email, sleep on it. You know, if you've got a big decision to make, get another person's point of view. Am I missing something? If it's a decision involving groups, particularly consciously get points of view from people who are different. So if it's all men making the decision, ask a couple women to weigh in. If it's all white people making the decision, ask some people of color to weigh in. Just see if they may be seeing something that you're not seeing. It doesn't mean you need to give up your agency about making the decision yourself, but maybe, maybe they could point out something that you didn't even notice because they're seeing it from a different perspective. It's hugely important. Oh, I clicked ahead here. Another one, I told you this before. Start watching other media sources. You know, what we do in our house, we have four. We'll watch CNN, uh, MSNBC, Fox, or BBC. BBC, I especially encourage you to, if you can, because seeing the view of the world from outside of the United States is really, really valuable, because they're really not locked into our pattern. And I know, they say, so what we'll do is we'll actually set a timer sometimes when it's a big event going on, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. And then just then we'll sit down, and my wife and I will talk about it, and say, well, what did you notice? So just as an example, um, we were watching a couple weeks ago in the um, – when the, uh, uh, the, the Russian investigation was really kicking in and you know, started watching MSNBC and it was like, you see, blah, 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 yeah, this, blah. and then we switched to Fox and the message was, you see, this is a liberal attempt, uh, an attempt on the left to overthrow a duly elected president. Two completely different points of view about the same thing. You know, are we willing to do the work as citizens? Are we willing to do the work as a community to really try to understand each other? Because there's no shortcut to this. There's no shortcut to understanding it. Also, be willing to admit that you're wrong. This is one of the things that we've lost as a society, a willingness to apologize. You know, most of the time when we say something, let's say we say something inadvertently that's offensive. Everybody here has probably done that at one time or another in your life. You said something without realizing it, that it would be perceived as hurtful. What do we do? We get ashamed. We pull back. We feel guilty. Guilt is a relatively worthless emotion in this regard. I'm not talking about it as a trigger, a momentary guilt. But when you get steeped in guilt, 
what happens? You withdraw. If somebody makes you feel guilty in your life, do you want to be with them more or less? Right. So if we start to look and say, okay, I didn't mean to do it. It wasn't on purpose. I did it. And you need to say, I'm sorry. But what usually happens, what usually happens is I'll be in an argument, you know, with, I'm sorry, remind me your name. Sarah. Sarah and I will be in an argument and I'll have that sick moment when I realize you're right. Do, do people usually, oh, Sarah, I'm sorry, I'm being a jerk. No, it's usually, God, look what time it is, I've got to go. You know, which I just noticed means I've got to go. It's time to do so. so um, and then open a dialogue and contra contra create constructive conversations like this. You know, take the time to talk with people. Really listen to each other. And I want to leave you, I'm going to zip ahead here. I want to leave you with this tool. This is a tool that's actually, um, I've adapted it from Elizabeth Lesser, to take the other to lunch. And I want to encourage you sometime in the next week to do this. Find somebody who you know has a different point of view than you and invite them to lunch. And when you go to lunch, set up some ground rules. And the ground rules are very simple. We're not here to persuade, defend, or interrupt each other. We're only here to be curious, authentic, and listen and understand each other better. We're not going to get into he said, she said. We're just going to try to listen. And then ask four, four questions. Okay? The first one, what are some of your life experiences that have led you to feel the way you do? So kind of tell me how you got here. And it's best, by the way, if you kind of create equal time so one person doesn't run on forever and then the other person only has a couple minutes. So why do you feel the way you do? And just listen. And then the other person does the same thing. Then the second question, this is a very important one, is what issues deeply concern you? What scares you? This is really important because fear is the prime motivator of human beings or compensation for fear. So if you can get to what it is that bothers them or, or frightens them, then you get a deeper understanding of what's motivating them. Then the third one is, what have you always wanted to ask someone from the other side? I've always wanted to ask somebody who, you know, voted for Jill Stein why you voted for her or whatever, you know, whatever it is. To actually listen, what, you know, ask, ask the question you want to ask. And then the last one, and this is really important, is there anything you'd like to say to clean up the past? In other words, you may, you may, which, by the way, it's fine if you take pictures of this, I don't care, and it's easier than writing down. Um, you may find, wow, now that I understand where you're coming from, I realize I've been kind of harshing on you. So I want to apologize for that. Because when you do that, you leave the past behind. You see, when you complete the past, you leave it behind. When you don't, you just drag it into the future. So I want to end with this picture. Um, and then we'll do some questions. Uh, this is an aspen forest. It's from, I think this was from northern Colorado. And I'd like to end with this picture because aspen trees are really quite remarkable in a way that I think makes them a good metaphor for who we are as human beings. You know, they're majestic. Some of you have probably seen these forests out in Utah and Colorado. These forests go on for, you know, miles, and they just cover the mountaintops with these trees that are 80 to 100 feet straight, straight tall. But you see, aspen trees are interesting because they're not individual trees at all. The way aspen trees grow is they send runners out. They call them volunteers, a root that goes and grows into another tree. They're the largest intact organisms in the world. The largest one that they've ever found in northern Utah 8,000 trees, one plant. For me, it's a perfect metaphor for who we are as human beings. Because on the surface, we look so different. We look so individual and distinct. But underneath the surface, what we're finding out now is that most of us process life in pretty much the same way. We have different data we're using, depending upon our circumstances, our identity, and all this stuff. But what we do with it is not that different. And if we really get that, really get it, then we can change our dialogue from, why do you see it that way, to, huh, why do you see it that way? When we move from fear to curiosity, we have the opportunity to create environments in which everybody can live. Thank you. Good. Sure, no problem at all. Yeah, so questions. Just raise your hand. We have a mic runner here. Thank you. Hi, if you wouldn't mind, just tell me your first names also. Okay. Um, my name is Kayla Warner, or Kayla. <laughs> um, I'm senior here. And so my question is, I was in one of your sessions earlier, I wasn't able to ask the question. But when it comes to putting yourself in another person's point of view or just putting yourself in other people's shoes, um, I have issue with doing that sometimes, especially when it comes to managed by identity and things that are intricate to who I am, so being a person of color, being a woman. And whenever I bring those things up, people, normally when it's like a white male or a white woman, they get very, very defensive, and the conversation ends. And so what is your advice for 
facilitating that conversation because usually it ends as soon as you bring up, hey, like you might be biased with this thing, people automatically think you're attacking when you're just pointing something out to get better. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I think there are a couple of things about that. First of all, for those of us who are in dominant groups, and everybody here is in a dominant group, one dominant group or another, just the very fact that you're here, you're in a dominant group by education. You may be in a dominant group by socioeconomic status or by religion or sexual orientation or race or gender or whatever else. Whenever we're in a dominant group, we have to understand that there's a power differential that gets created by the fact of that dominance. And so it's harder, it's, it's less safe, let me put it that way, for somebody who's in a non-dominant non group to share about that issue than it is for somebody who's in a dominant group. Um, it's harder for people of color to talk about race, for example, than it is for white people because it's not hard, it's more dangerous because there's a whole history of that being a way that it's been used to hurt me. So it's important for us to recognize that. And what that means is for those of us who are in dominant groups, we have a responsibility to create that opening, to, to create a listening. The second part of it is it's important for us to recognize that when we're in dominant groups, we're not as likely, like we said earlier, we're not as likely to see the dynamics of that issue. So for example, um, as, a, as a woman of color, um, you're likely to see race and gender more easily than I will. I've got to actually work to do that in order to understand it. And one big part of my education over the years has been talking to a lot of women of color, you know, and really listening. Um, but because of the fact that societally we've created this sort of good person, bad person paradigm, we listen from that place. So I couldn't quite hear your name, I'm sorry. Kayla, okay. So Kayla comes up to me, for example, as a white man, and she says, I'd love to talk with you about my experience as a woman of color, and my brain goes, danger, Will Robinson. She's undoubtedly going to call me a racist and a sexist. That's my response. Um, okay, I'll be glad to talk about that. And so one of the things that, that I encourage people to do is to name that coming in. So, so one of the things you might do, if you were, for example, approaching me, is you might say, um, look, I was wondering if you'd be comfortable talking about some dynamics of race and gender with me. I know this sometimes makes people a little weird. And I'm comfortable. I want you to know I'm not at all interested in attacking you or making you wrong. I would just love to talk with you about it. Now that creates some boundaries that I can feel a little safer in. And I'm not, I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that it's your job to take care of me. It's not that. It's just there is this thing, which we're now discovering more and more, called white fragility. And that is that we get really sensitive as white folks, for example, about conversations about race. Because for years, when conversations about race come over, it feels like it's an attack on us. And I have to, you know, being in a diversity space for more than 35 years now professionally, I have to say that we have to own some of that. The people in diversity have to own some of that because we have done some of this with a club sometimes. And we do put people on the defensive. And being on the defensive doesn't help. Then once we have an agreement, we've agreed on that, then it's much more likely we can do that. And then if, if it feels a little tense, sometimes it doesn't hurt also to stop and say, how are we doing here? You know, can we hear it? Can, are we hearing each other? And, and one tool that I often will use in those conversations is, would you just repeat back to me what I said? Just I want to be sure that you got what I said. And then I may do the same. So we're kind of checking it out with each other. But, you know, there are going to be certain people who you're going to be able to have those conversa conversations with, but certain people you aren't. Some people are just too dug in. And so, so but, but that's the main advice I could give is to name it. The more, the, the more we name it, we can name it and frame it, then there's, there's safety for people. People have got to have some sense that there's a boundary to where the conversation's going in when it's a dangerous conversation. And if you create that kind of agreement, it can be really helpful. So I hope that helps. Who else? Yeah, please. She, does she need to do for the, because I can hear her fine. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. I've, I've been told by some people before that it's not my place. They're like, I can't have a say in anything. It's not really my place. Yeah. Especially when it comes to more like the um, like ethnicity. Sure. Um, I, how do you approach that situation? Look, there, there are people who feel like, you know, you can't have any investment in, in race, for example, if you're not of color. You can't have, you know. Look, my response is, first of all, diversity applies to everybody. And the same person who tells me that you can't have, you know, I can't have anything um, to say about race, 
I, I could turn around and say, well, I'm Jewish, and so you obviously can't say anything about anti-Semitism, or maybe you can't say anything about sexual orientation either because you're not gay. Maybe you can't say anything. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a kind of a very closed box. Now, there's one thing. It's one thing to say, um, I don't think that you understand it deeply enough, in which case the response could be, great, can we talk? I'd love to understand it better. Um, my personal feeling is that unless we get everybody engaged in these solutions, we're not going to have any, we're not going to get any from where we're going. Because, because when we say that, when we say that you can't talk about gender because you're a man, we reinforce the them versus us between men and women. When we say you can't talk about race because you're white, we reinforce that break between that, that racial difference. Or you can't talk about sexual orientation because you're straight. You know, we need to be able to develop allyship with each other. So, and, and the other thing is to just recognize that some people, you're going to run into some people who have those attitudes. Look, I started doing, when I started doing diversity and inclusion work, there was maybe one straight white guy around the country who was doing it. I mean, I mean that seriously, because there weren't that many people at all doing it back then. And I have this question all the time, what are you doing doing this? You know? I said, look, you know, I could tell you my story if you want. You know, I have a family background. We lost, uh, well, we know 43 members of our family died in two days on August 2nd and 3rd, 1942, when the Nazis came into the village in the western Ukraine that my grandfather grew up and they killed all but 100 of the 5,000 Jews who lived there. I grew up doing this work because I was told in my family, bad things can happen and you're supposed to do something about it. Um, if people don't want to engage with me, I've gotten to the point where I say, I got it. You don't want to engage with me. I'll engage with people who do. So if people don't want to engage with you, don't let it stop you. Don't let it stop your commitment. Just, you know, understand that some people are going to feel that way. And, and also understand where it comes from. Because where it comes from is a well-earned distrust of white people, particularly among people of color. Because people of color, particularly African Americans in our culture, have heard thousands and thousands of white people mouth nice liberal things and then do something completely the opposite. And so there, it's not personal towards you. It's learned experience and protected experience. And we have to honor that as well. Not make them wrong, but just understand if, you, if you're not want to engage with me, okay, we won't engage. But that doesn't make you wrong for feeling that way because you've been burned a lot of times. And history shows us that. Um, so there's legitimacy to that point of view, but it doesn't mean it has to stop you. Okay. One more? Okay, great. Who else? In the back. Yes. difference between collaboration and polarity and how that can uh, lead to the way that we see other people. Um, in a world that is becoming so polarized, how would you suggest that we encourage our leaders to uh, approach making decisions about our country with a spirit of collaboration instead of a polarized view? Yeah, one of the challenges we have, one of the challenges we have um, with our leadership right now, and it actually plays, it plays out in, in our personal relationships too, is that we're so entrenched in them versus us that we don't have any common us. That the good of the country is now secondary to my political party winning. Which is, what's, which is why I said that it's so dangerous. Because if we look historically at the, um, at the best legislations we've created, at the best solutions we've come up with the problems, they've almost always come out of collaboration between conservatives and liberals. Because conservatives and liberals look from different lenses. And if we can get the best of both is where we get really sound, you know, if you, if you think of it in these terms, you know, we talk about liberty and justice for all in our society, that liberals generally tend to worry about justice and conservatives generally tend to worry about liberty. But the problem is either one of them unchecked doesn't work. If you have liberty unchecked, you get massive disparities in society where people do horrible things to other people because they have free reign to do them. You know, if you let justice go unchecked, then you have this notion everybody's going to tell you what to do and what the fair way to be is. And that's where you get totalitarianism. That's where you get, you know, the excessive stuff that we see in, in excessive communist cultures and things where the government's going to tell you everything to do. It's the combination of the two that makes this culture, that has made this culture so remarkable over time, that we're looking for liberty and justice for all. And so similarly, you know, we've got to, we've got to hold our leaders to that standard. Rather than what's happening now, which is if a politician is seen, for example, when, when President Obama was president, if a, if a Republican politician was seen you know, standing next to him too closely, it was considered a ding on him. And there's some people who feel the same way in the progressive left now, that if a politician is too cozy with conservatives, then it's considered a ding against them. We have to hold people to a standard and say, we're, we know you've got points of view, we agree with you on your points of view, but unless you demonstrate that you're really willing to work with people, to really put 
something above your own personal needs, you're not going to get my support. And that's the only way we're going to get our leaders to move, is when we hold the higher standard. And again, I want to be really clear. I'm not suggesting at all that you can't have a strong political point of view. You could have a tremendously strong political point of view, but remember it's a point of view, as opposed to thinking it's truth and goodness, and they're evil and bad. Because that's where we are right now. They're evil. We don't even stop to worry about why people feel the way they feel that way. If you feel that way, I write you off. You know, one of the things, you know, probably not surprising to all of you, I am, um, you know, I voted Democrat in the last election, and I realized I kind of got stuck in this us versus them, so I, I kind of took a retreat, like cleared my mind a little bit, then I started interviewing people who voted for President Trump. And I interviewed 48 officially, because it's part of the research I was doing for this new book. And it completely changed my view. You know, I don't call them Trump supporters anymore. And I don't think they, we should call people Clinton supporters either, because there's such a wide range of why people did it. People had lots of different distinctions. Certain things were important. One young woman who I've known since she was a kid is homeschooling her, ch her children, and she felt like Hillary Clinton wasn't supportive of homeschooling. So that was the issue. She, in her words, I held my nose and voted for him because that's the most important issue for me. For other people, it's gun control. For other people, it's abortion. For somebody else, it's defense. You know, whatever it is, we've got reasons for doing this. But as soon as we block them into a group and objectify them, then there's no hope of getting across. And, and it's only going to start when citizens like you and I stand up and say, we're sick and tired of this pointing fingers and demonizing each other. We need you to come up with some solutions. You know, this kind of a thing where people are calling each other names and all this nonsense. It's like, we need some adults at the head. That's what we really need. And, and you know, your generation, hopefully, will help us get there. But, it's, but it starts here. So I just, I really couldn't encourage you more to find somebody to take the lunch. Really try that out. And then once you've done it once, do it again and again and again. And you, I promise you that if you really stick to not being judgmental and really focus on listening, it will open the aperture of your mind. All of a sudden you'll realize that there are people who feel completely different about that issue that's so important to you, but they're not bad people. They just come from a different orientation. Even issues like abortion. You know, we can learn to coexist with different points of view. But it starts when we make human connection. And that's what we need the most. Thank you all so much. I wish we had more time.